Today's podcast is brought to you by Precious Metals Advisor Tom Cloud. With nearly 40 years' experience in the precious metals industry, Tom Cloud offers sound advice and the best rates on precious metals. Learn more at ftmdaily.com forward slash gold. Ah, friends, welcome to the Monday edition of Follow the Money Daily, a daily podcast dedicated to your personal, spiritual, and financial freedom, found right here every single day on ftmdaily.com. That stands for Follow the Money Daily. I'm your host, Jerry Robinson, author of the book Bankruptcy of Our Nation and the publisher here at ftmdaily.com. And as always, I'm joined by my lovely co-host and national director for the Christian Financial Advisor Network, Jennifer Robinson. Hey, Jennifer. Hey, Jerry. By the way, if you uh, want to get that book, Bankruptcy of Our Nation, you can find that on our website, ftmdaily.com. You'll see a picture of the book on the right-hand side. You can click on that. It's also an audio book. And so if you haven't read a copy of Jerry's book, Bankruptcy of Our Nation, It'll give you a lot of good background on what we talk about every single day. It's really a foundational book to read if you're following our website and our podcast. Yeah, and if you become an FTM Insider, we automatically send you a free copy of the book. But that audio book, uh, somebody approached us about a year ago. Um, the the name of the group was... Uh, yeah, Listen and Think Audio. Listen and Think Audio. And they said we you know, we love the book we want to put it in audiobook format we said sure and it's done fantastic we've been so surprised at the number of people who want the audiobook version yeah exactly and i i think that's what a lot of people are using now because you can just download it on your phone and listen to it in the car or wherever you, you are going so it's a really good way to read the book now uh this week is a holiday week friday is july 4th so we will be taking a little break on Friday. No podcast on Friday, but we'll have a podcast Monday through Thursday this week. So be sure to tune in every day. Um, a lot of news and things have happened over the weekend and early this Monday morning. Uh, what are we starting out with today, Jerry? Well, there's several things we want to cover, uh, but today we're only going to focus on one. But let me just roll out some of the headlines that we've noticed over the weekend. First of all, ISIS, uh, the group the radical uh, terrorist group uh, running all the rough shot all over Iraq and Syria, uh, declaring a caliphate, a caliphate. In fact, uh, we're going to be doing a big show on this this week uh, to give you more information about this. But the announcement came on the first day of the Muslim holy month of Ramadan. So there are a lot of some symbolism there, uh, a lot of interesting historical facts about what this caliphate is. Uh, many of you already know about it. We've been I wrote about the caliphate back in the early parts, right after 2001, you know, talking about this caliphate. But overall, uh, what the current form uh, of this ISIS caliphate is taking, is going to be very interesting to see. And I, I'll save that for a future show, but we're going to talk about that later this week. Uh, a few other things happening. First of all, the Supreme Court, uh, big ruling on the Hobby Lobby Obamacare case. Uh, we'll be talking about that a little bit later this week. Uh, the Bank of International Settlements warned of massive asset bubbles. Uh, central banks are now uh, fearful that their economic recovery, quote unquote, has now become the new bubble. What do you know? These guys start pumping all the money in, and then all of a sudden they start warning everybody, oh, you know, don't take the money and, and speculate with it. Well, you know, maybe you should raise interest rates and people won't speculate. But anyway, the Bank of International Settlements, which is the central bank of central banks, it is the the top central bank um, is warning now of massive asset bubbles. That in the New York Times this morning. Uh, Stansbury and Associates is claiming that tomorrow the dollar will completely collapse. Where have we heard this story before? Well, they're telling you that it's going to happen on July 1st because of FATCA. And uh, you can you know Google that July 1st dollar collapse and you'll see all of the hubbub. In essence, what it is, is an investment firm, an investment newsletter firm, I should say, that has put out a special report for, I think, about $149. And if you pay the $149, you'll discover why and when the dollar will collapse. 
Friends, we tell you that stuff for free. Uh, you don't need to pay money to hear uh, when the dollar co- is going to collapse or whatever. I mean, that's just silly. Uh, it's it's historically evident. Uh, but uh, they've made a lot of big hubbub over this July 1st, probably made a ton of money and got a lot of people spooked and scared. So we'll see. We'll see. Tomorrow is the day. Well, Stansberry says the dollar will collapse tomorrow. Let's just go ahead and see. All right, but let's, uh, by the way, gas prices are also at a six-year high. We're going to try to fit some oil stuff in this week as well. But listen, today, here's what we're going to talk about. This is a big story, and it may not be getting as much coverage as perhaps it should, but the L.A. Times, uh, CBS Detroit, uh, have certainly put out some good stories on this. There's been a few other good stories on this, but recently... Um, in the city of Detroit, many people have been unable to pay their water bill. Uh, there's a story here in the LA Times of uh, a lady by the name of Nicole Hill. She's had her water turned off for six weeks. Dirty dishes are piling up in the sink of her crowded kitchen, the story says. Uh, small garbage cans filled with water from a neighbor. A uh, bigger one sits outside in the yard where she hopes it will collect some rain. Uh, she has had to develop a intricate recycling system, according to the story, to wash her dishes, to clean her floors, to flush the toilet, all with the same water. And uh, she's actually a single mother who's studying down at the local college. And she is just one of thousands of residents in Detroit who have had their water and sewer services turned off because they don't pay their bills. And, you know, Detroit's emerging from bankruptcy right now. The water utility in Detroit is currently owed $90 million from customers who are in arrears on their utility bills. Nearly half of the city's 300,000 accounts are past due. And so... It boils down to this. Is access to water a human right? Is it something that the city or the municipality owes to the people? Or is it something that is a convenience and a luxury? Well, let's frame it this way. Down in the center of Detroit, there is the municipal water supply. From from there runs an intricate network of aging but still valid and good pipes that travel all the way out, spanning all across the city, and they come right into the home of people like Nicole Hill, who cannot afford the water that comes out of that tap. She wants to be able to walk up to the faucet, and she wants to be able to turn the knob and have water flow like liquid gold out of her faucet. One big problem with that. That costs money. It costs money to have water piped clear across the city into your home to where all you have to do is walk in and turn a dial. Now, people didn't have that for over 5,000 years, six, almost nearly 6,000 years. We haven't had indoor plumbing. People have survived. The question becomes, is that ability to walk into your, your kitchen and turn the knob and get instant water, is that a right? Does the city owe you that? If you don't pay your bills, should society pay your bills? I mean, it's a very valid question. And by the way, it's not the government that's going to finance this, of course. The government will be the one who writes the check. The government will be the one who uh, allows this to happen. But, of course, they bill the citizenry of Detroit. So the question really becomes this. Do the people of Detroit who pay their bills and have jobs and work hard, must they pay for people like Nicole Hill, who instead of working down at McDonald's during the day, decides to go down to her local community college and study? She probably has a smartphone. I don't want to assume too much about Nicole Hill. I don't know her. But I would imagine that many of these people who have their water turned off probably have a smartphone, probably have cable. Many of them probably have a car. Most of them probably have food in the cabinets or in the cupboards that they did not pay for. And by the way, 
This is another issue. And I, I want to stay on water, but I want to talk about food very briefly because when you walk into Walmart and you pay at the checkout, sometimes somebody will be in front of you and they whip out a card that looks just like a Visa or just like a MasterCard and they swipe it and they pay. But in, in fact, they didn't pay at all. The government paid. And that is called SNAP benefits. It's like food stamps. But what they have done with food stamps, remember the old food stamps that you, you would get in the mail? I mean, I remember seeing those whenever I was a kid because we were poor. I remember seeing the food stamps. I saw them with my own eyes when I was a child. And they were these green, I think they were green food stamps. I remember seeing them. They were humiliating. I remember being in the store when I was a kid and my mom would pay with those food stamps. And I was embarrassed because I realized that we weren't paying for our groceries. The people around us were paying for our groceries. That was humiliating. And what the government has done is they've taken out the sting and all the humiliation and the stigma that's attached to taking government benefits. And they have put all those benefits now on a reloadable debit card, almost, of sorts, that works just like a Visa, and nobody knows. So who in the world, in their right mind, would ever give up that benefit? If you could walk into Walmart and have a gift card there every time waiting for you, how many of you would use it? Now, I am certainly not saying in today's broadcast that I believe that people should not be supported because I do believe that we owe, as a society, we have got to take care of those who cannot take care of themselves. And when I say things like that, I'm referring to people who are disabled, orphans, widows who are completely, uh, they can't take care of themselves. But the Bible is very clear on whose role that is. That the orphans and the widows are the role of the church. In fact, that's why governments give tax breaks to nonprofits. One of the major reasons why governments give tax breaks to nonprofits is because nonprofits are supposed to help the widows and the orphans. And in exchange for that, the government doesn't have to do it, and so they give tax breaks to the nonprofit. But what the problem with nonprofits is, is that they don't use the money most of the time for widows and orphans in their community. They use it to build carnivals. They, they use it to build new wings on their, on their church building. And Jerry, in this story from the L.A. Times, Nicole Hill has called around to, it says in the story, she has called numerous service organizations, i.e. nonprofits and churches, and has found no relief to help her turn her water back on. She owes about $5,700, which that's, that's a lot. But she cannot find anyone who will help her. Nobody who is receiving tax benefits from the government will help this poor lady get her water back on. Well, like you said earlier before the show, I wonder how many of these churches have uh, $1,000 fireworks displays get ready to go. Yeah, and how how many had uh, these huge Christmas light displays over Christmas that cost tens of thousands in electric bill over the uh, Christmas months? I mean, we could go on and on about how these different organizations spend their money, and that's a whole different show. But that's exactly right that how many of them will have these fireworks shows that cost thousands of dollars, and how many citizens of Detroit are just living right around that church building that have no running water at the moment. Well, here's the thing. Here's what you'll hear from nonprofits. Nonprofits will immediately step in and say, listen, we can only help so many people, first of all. And second of all, some people don't need our help because they don't deserve it, because they're, they can clearly help themselves. Well, we need you to tell that to the government, right? We need you to tell that to the government because the government uh, wants to grow. And it while it says that it doesn't want to help these people and provide more benefits from them because it's broke, they would, in a heartbeat, be happy to, to tax you more, take your money, and then spend it uh, the way that they see fit. The reason that I'm concerned about this is because this is a microcosm of the United States in about 20 years, 30 years. Detroit is a microcosm of a bankrupt America. It's a city where people cannot afford to pay their water bills. And... It, it's causing me to rethink this whole society thing that we have. Are we really going to say that everybody in the United States 
is advanced enough economically to be able to afford water that comes from clear across the town through a network of pipes right to your right into your faucet are we really going to say that society has to pay for that for every single person is that a right i disagree i cl- i 100% disagree with that statement because at the very end of this sentence or at the very end of this story in the LA Times Nicole Hill explains that she is so fearful because she doesn't have water and she says quote I literally feel like I'm going back to little house on the prairie days she said well Did people in the little house on the prairie days die? What did they do when they needed water? Well, they actually had to get up, go get water, and bring it back to their house. Some people, friends, don't have enough money to enjoy the luxuries of this economy. And we have to make a decision. Either we are going to say, Everybody needs the luxury of being able to turn water on in their house. I mean, that's just a human right. We're going to pay for it. If they can't afford it, we'll pay for it for them. We need to decide. Are we going to do that? Are we going to pay for everybody to have instant? Because I tell you what, if you have a free gift card down to Walmart, are you going to spend it all? Are you going to spend some of it? If they give you free water, are you going to take a five-minute shower or a 30-minute shower? I think, the, I think the answer is clear here. If you give something away, it's not as valued, and people will abuse it. So why not this? Why not have some sort of obstacle for people who are able but just can't manage their money right? I'm not saying these people aren't poor. I'm sure they are. But I would love to know how many of them have smartphones. If your water bill is turned, if your water is turned off to your house but your smartphone's on, you know there's some problems. So I say this. This is just a on the off the cuff kind of recommendation. But why not create communities for people who clearly cannot afford to pay for the miracle of water that travels from the center of the city through this intricate network of pipes right to their sink. Why not have a community of people who can't afford that kind of lifestyle? That's that's a luxury. Why not have a community where people can live and then there's a real big lake out there nearby that they can go and they can take their buckets out to, they can bring it back, they can decontaminate it, and they can use it. It's free. We have to start thinking about things like this, friends, because in 20 years, as the baby boomers begin to retire and they don't have retirement savings to prop them up, this question is going to keep coming up. It's going to keep coming up in every city in America. And Detroit could become the precedent for the rest of the country over the next two decades, three decades. So it's important that we get this question right. We need to get the answer to this question right. I think it's the same way with uh, government benefits when it comes to uh, food. When they give you a SNAP card, uh, listen, I've met some people who are wealthy who get SNAP benefits. Why? Why? Because when you walk into their kitchen, you you see items that come from Walmart. When they go to pay for the items at Walmart, they swipe the card. Nobody knows. Why would anybody give that up? I mean, if it's free, why would you give it up? So in in order to get the wrong people off of these benefits who don't deserve them, you have to create a stigma with them. You have to. Otherwise, you don't have any incentive for people not to use them. So here's another thing you can do. Create a... Government grocery store. That's the only place that you can go whenever you get a snap card. All right. You don't get to go to Walmart. Sorry. You know, that's where rich people go, man. That's where people who actually have jobs go. Okay. If you don't have a job, you have to go down to the government grocery store. The government grocery store sells white boxes of cereal, white boxes. Everything's white with black letters. It's instantly recognizable as government food. Hey, look, there's not a picture of a rabbit on the front of the Trix box. It's called Fruit Puffs in black, right? There's no fancy advertising on it. That costs money. You don't get to, you don't get to buy that stuff whenever you're getting government money. 
You don't get to buy trick cereal. You don't get to buy the name brand stuff. You have to buy the government stuff until you finally get a job. Until you no longer are taking money from the public treasury. There has to be some sort of stigma attached to taking government money. If not, we're never going to solve this problem. In fact, people are going to be lining up to take government money. You have to provide a stigma. So create a government grocery store. Put one in every community. Don't let these people walk in with with their snap card into Walmart. Isn't it interesting, Jerry, how our veterans, our military personnel, they have to go to a special hospital, a special medical clinic, the VA hospital, in order to receive their benefits, even though in many uh, they fully uh, worked for those benefits. They did serve in the in the military and many of them overseas in a war zone. They have a stigma to their benefits, but yet those who are receiving food benefits have no stigma at all. They don't even have to um, they don't even look like they're paying with food stamps anymore. They're like you said, they, they just look like they're paying with a visa. So that's that is definitely backwards, in my opinion. And, uh, you know, the VA, of course, is a whole nother story as well. But uh, you're so right that these EBT cards, the food stamps and then with this water situation, these are definitely unsustainable luxuries that people like you and I will be paying for if we decide that the people of Detroit should get free tap water from the city. And I think, you know, when I read this story, Jerry, I saw this lady, Nicole Hill, and she had moved into her apartment five years ago and had not, uh, what I gathered from the story is that she had not paid any of her water bills And just finally, a few months ago, the water had gotten shut off. Now, you cannot tell me that she didn't know that by not paying her bill, her water would eventually get shut off. Any adult person knows that. I'm sure she got notice after notice. So if she was so worried about water like she is now, I'm wondering, while she was getting the free water and not paying her bill, why wasn't she filling up barrels and gallon jugs and water bottles preparing for this time whenever the water was shut off? That's such a good point. And back to your point about the VA, these people who served in our country, they deserve to be taken care of. If they have health issues, they should not have these wait times. You know, the VA hospital is an absolute wreck. I I know there's good people working in those places, but I tell you what, they're overwhelmed. And these veterans are being treated so poorly. And yet somebody who has eight kids gets to go down to Walmart, walk in, and they get treated better than somebody who served in the war. What, because you have eight kids? Look, the government has the ability to steer the public through incentives, uh, through taxes and through benefits uh, that are dispensed by the government. You can form and fashion behavior. You can manipulate people's behavior. You can get them to do what you want. For example, if you want more nonprofits in your country, if you want more uh, of those, then you can make it easier to become a nonprofit. And you can, or if you want uh, more people on welfare, then you can make the standards to achieve it much easier, much lower. You can lower the standards. I mean, government gets what it wants. And so right now, apparently what it wants are people who are becoming overwhelmingly dependent upon it. That's what they want. I mean, they may disagree with that, but their actions betray them. But to your point, to your earlier point about uh, Nicole Hill, this individual who is in this story, who just represents one of 150,000 people who are behind on their bills, water bill in uh, Detroit. You're right. She knew that the water was eventually going to go off. As she went to college, instead of going to work and didn't pay her bills, she knew that the water was going to be turned off. So the question is not, should we give her free water? The very first question is, why did she not prepare herself for this? Why did she not see it coming? Well, because that's what the government has created. It has created an entitlement mentality to where if I don't pay my bills, Somebody's going to pay them for me. I'm not going to pay my bills. I don't have to pay my bills. Listen, we need to get to a place where we will fully admit 
that some things in this economy are luxuries and not everybody can have them. And water, by the way, is not a luxury. But water being delivered directly to your faucet with a turn of a button, that's a luxury. I'm sorry. That's a luxury that people have survived without for 59, 5,800 years. Running water is not a right. Okay? It's not a right. Access to water should never be restricted. The, the, if the government wants to provide access to water to people, let them provide access to water for people. But they don't have to provide it through the existing network that people pay for. But I'll tell you, some of these guys I know who are taking SNAP benefits and they, and they shouldn't be doing it, I guarantee if their friends walked in to their kitchen and saw the white box that said fruit puffs and black on it, instantly, instantly, you know, they're taken from the government. That's a stigma. We are, we are removing all the stigmas of government benefits. We're taking them all the way. We're not demanding any kind of novel thinking on these things. We're simply saying, well, if they can't pay the water, pay it for them. Well, I'm, I'm completely for the invalids. Doing, if you can't go dig a ditch, if you can't go dig a well, that's fine. You know, you, we should take care of you. Actually, the churches should play a role in that. But regardless, if the churches won't, the government will, whatever. We need to take care of those people. But if you're able-bodied and you just don't want to miss your story during the day and you don't want to get up off the couch because you don't want to go dig a well or you don't want to drive down and get a barrel of water, I'm sorry. I'm very sorry for you. But I cannot pay for your water bill because you don't want to do that. Just like you won't pay for my stuff. I don't want to mow my lawn. Well, somebody's got to mow it. Well, I don't want to mow it, and I'm not going to pay for it. Well, somebody has to pay for it. Everything has a consequence. And um, I tell you, this is really something. This is really something about the what's happening in Detroit. As I mentioned, it's a microcosm of the problem that is plaguing America. And I know we've only put out a few ideas this morning. We probably haven't put out the best solutions. And, I, you know, it, this is off the cuff. But I saw this story this morning, and I said, we've got to do something. We've got to rethink this system. This system is breaking. We organize society in a way, well, that is in many ways unsustainable. And so we have to fix it before it spirals out of control. We have to come up with different solutions than just handing out more benefits to more people because they want them. And I, I think that starts with just you and your own household and making sure that if you ever came into a time in your life where you couldn't pay your water bill, then you have some water on hand or you know of a good place that you can go down, maybe a lake or a pond or a creek, and maybe you have a little uh, hand pump water filter that you can go get some water. I think that's the very first step is making sure that you are prepared for any times that may come across in your life where you don't have enough water or enough food. And uh, if you are prepared, then you can uh, take steps to uh, try to change society and, and to try to make a difference politically. But we always say uh, the time is uh, it's not the time to be arguing things. It's time to prepare. If you're not prepared personally in your own family, then uh, that's the first step to take, I believe. Absolutely. Now, these people uh, in Detroit, I'll close with this. The people in Detroit, maybe they ought to have the ability to have a vote. Maybe they should have a vote and say, okay, we got all these people who don't can't pay their water bill. And so I'm working hard at my job. I'm a Detroit voter, all right? And I'm doing everything that I possibly can to put food on the table. I'm working hard. I'm barely paying my bills. But you know what? I pay my bills, right? I pay the water bill before I pay the smartphone bill, all right? I got my, I got my stuff together. I'm taking care of my kids. And now the, the state of Detroit is asking me to vote. And they're saying, listen, uh, you have a choice. You can pay for these people who won't pay the water bill, or you cannot. It's up to you. If you don't, if you vote to say no, we have a plan B. Plan B is this. We're going to go to our nonprofits in Detroit, and we're going to say, you're going to help. Because the people, we're not going to put this on the backs of the people, because the people are already breaking from all the things we've put on them. We cannot put this on them, too. So because we give you tax benefits, because we give you tax breaks, because we give you all of this, and in return we expect you to help the poor and help the needy, 
that's kind of why we give you tax breaks, then you have a choice. You can help the people. You can lose your nonprofit status. To be completely honest with you, I don't care if they do that or not. I don't care. The nonprofits of this country are designed to help people. If you're running a nonprofit and your whole goal is to make a profit, you should be, you should be taken down. You should be taken down, and I don't care if the government takes you down. You know, these nonprofits need to help people, or they shouldn't get tax breaks. One of the two. I mean, it's just simple. You can't, you can't play both sides of the field. And if they come up there and say, well, you know, the nonprofits say, well, we can't help the people because, it, you know, we're having a big building fund and we're trying to build a carnival for the kid. Listen, man, there's people who need water. And that's, I think, the very first role of a nonprofit to, f- to give a cold cup of water to the orphan, to give a cold cup of water to the child. And I don't know if it's society's role to do that when the church has as much money as they do. That's my, that's my point. All right. Well, that's a whole barrel of monkeys, and I'm sure many of you have thoughts on that. You got some thoughts, send them to us, info at ftmdaily.com, or you can call us at 800-609-5530 and uh, sound off on what you think. Uh, let us know. We'll be happy to share some of your comments on the air, uh, you know, if and when we receive them. Or you can always leave a comment down at the bottom of this page. Love to hear your thoughts. Realize we are just kind of digging here. We don't have solid answers. This is kind of off the cuff, but friends, we're heading into a very negative time. If we don't get our stuff together here, if we don't have a plan for this, it's only going to get worse. What you're seeing, as I said in Detroit, is a microcosm of America's bankruptcy. We're going to see this spread to other cities. More people are going to need help. And it's going to have to come down to this. Are we going to help them by paying more taxes? Or are we going to help them by restructuring the system? Or are we going to help them by forcing nonprofits who receive tax benefits to pitch in. Well, the stock market this Monday morning is up just ever so slightly. The S&P 500 at 1961, gold is at 1318 and silver down a little bit today at $20.94. Yeah, the market's uh, still kind of staying steady. Some of our stocks in our trigger trade report are doing nice this morning. Looks like some, we're getting some rebounding. Uh, gold and silver also staying steady, just slot down slightly. Uh, we're going to be doing a big show later on this week, uh, as I mentioned, on the Bank of International Settlements. We're going to talk about who they are, but also this new report they just put out. It's an annual report talking about how these markets are super frothy, as if we all didn't already know that. And uh, we're going to be talking a little bit more about what that might mean uh, in the near future for these uh, global markets, which have just been in a massive bull run all around the world. So we'll be talking about that soon. Well, friends, that brings us to the end of our program. Thank you so much for choosing to allow me into your life each and every day right here on Follow the Money Daily. And as always, I leave you with this final word, kind of well-themed, taken from the book of Second Thessalonians chapter 3. Verse 10, when the Apostle Paul said, For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule, the one who is unwilling to work, let him not eat. Good biblical advice for us to keep in mind this Monday morning. As always, remember, when you want the truth about the global economy, just follow the money. We'll see you right back here again tomorrow. Until then, God bless. All of the information contained on Follow the Money is strictly for informational and educational purposes. The views and opinions of our guests and sponsors, including Tom Cloud and Jay Peroni, are their own and do not necessarily represent the views of FTMDaily.com or Robinson Media Group, LLC. Jerry and Jennifer Robinson do hold their insurance licenses and may offer consulting on life insurance and fixed retirement income products. Jennifer Robinson is an investment advisor representative with Faith Based Investor LLC. Remember, never do your financial planning through podcast or radio. It's your money. Be wise. Do your due diligence and always consult a trusted financial professional before making any financial decisions.